Agnieszka Rodziewicz received her bachelor degree in cultural studies and then an MA degree in sociology as well as a PhD in sociology in the University of Warsaw. Her research interests include transnationalism, remigration and deportation, which of course is the topic of today's very important talk. Prior to joining the university, Agnieszka worked at the University of Warsaw in Poland and for her thesis entitled Living Leaving the Deportation Regime, Power and Violence in Deportation from the United States, she was granted Mexican government scholarship for foreign researchers. During her repeated visits to Mexico, she documented lived experience of deportees from the USA. Very challenging work indeed. Agnieszka continued this research topic while working as a visiting fellow at the University of Michigan in Abor in the United States. She's a recipient of many awards, including the Jan Joseph Lipscott Master's Thesis competition awarded by the Open Republic, Association Antisemitism and Xenophobia, a laureate in Master's Thesis competition held by the Center for Latin American Studies, University of Warsaw, and the Prime Minister of Poland for her doctoral thesis. Her numerous publications have included co-authored books, Migrants as Agents of Social Change, so, sorry, of Change, Social Remittance in an Enlarged European Union, published in Polgrave, by Polgrave in 2017, and Ethmore Morality of Care Migrants and Their Aging Parents, published by Routledge in 2018. One of her articles was awarded the third best prize in the Renus Penix Best Award paper at the 11th annual IMSCO conference. When joining the University of Wolverhampton back in November 2018, Agnieszka was awarded 190,000 euros individual fellowship by the European Commission for the two-year BRAD project, supervised by Dr. Aleksandra Dolinsky. The full title of this project is Brexit and Deportations towards a comprehensive and transnational understanding of a new system targeting EU citizens. And that best describes the research objectives. Agnieszka focused on several aspects of this new regime, immigration policies, the agencies that try and enforce them, public debate that accompanies changes in migration policies and their implementation. Migrants that become deportable, as well as return migrants, and indeed stayers sent back in sending countries who consider migrating to the UK and who adjust their mobility and immobility strategies according to or resisting migration policies. Tough work indeed. During her stay in Wolverhampton, Agnieszka publi has published three articles, a further one text accepted for publication and three others under review. She presented no less than seven papers at international conferences and has organized four conference panels, including the workshop on research methods in deportation in Wolverhampton in September this year. Agnieszka was also invited to give numerous talks to other universities in many countries. As well, she was presented by the media in Poland, the UK and in Mexico. It's no secret that she's an absolute star of the Area Studies Unit of Assessment for the REF 2021. And as if this was not enough, while here, somehow she managed to find time to study for her PG Cert and became a fellow of the Higher Education Authority. Therefore, it is so sad that we actually say goodbye to Agnieszka with this talk. But before we do that, let us give a virtual floor to Agnieszka, whose talk is titled European Deportations and the Hostile Environment in the UK. Agnieszka, it's lovely to have you with us. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Theo. I hope that you can hear me now. Uh, my my apologies for for coming late and uh, just I will need your confirmation if you can see my screen that I would like to share. We can. 
it's working That's well. Well done. <laughs> now it's working. Once again, sorry for the technical hiccups. This is what happens when it's all online. Nonetheless, I'm happy that we can have people also from outside of Wolverhampton. So uh, thank you very much for this welcome, Phil. Thank you very much uh, for, for those of you who are attending in spite of these technical problems. So without further ado, I would like to, to start this presentation. Um, and I would like to start it with uh, this illustration about the Polish deportation flight. So on the 30th of uh, April 2020, under the national lockdown here in the UK, a chartered flight left Stansted Airport with 33 deportees on board and as many home office escorts. One of the passengers had been tested positive after showing, showing COVID-19 symptoms and the others were not tested at all because this was the time of the scarcity of the tests. Um, so it was impossible to keep sufficient distance between the passengers to prevent the, sp the spread of the deadly disease on the plane. The flight was headed to Poland in spite of the fact that Polish borders had been closed for 47 days. The plane landed as Poland was preparing for the celebration of the 16th anniversary of Poland's EU's membership much quieter than in the previous years because almost all of the population was isolating at their homes. Five of the deported were detained by the police uh, as the police was looking for them and the remaining 27 men and women were now free to go home for compulsory 14 days self-isolation. Of course, if they still had a place they could call home in Poland. United Kingdom has officially left United, uh, European Union on the 31st of January 2020, but we are still in transition period. It's still 23 days to go to, to, to end the transition period and the EU treaties remain in force, uh, which means that the EU citizens are given the preferential treatment. However, as this vignette shows, the EU citizens were being deported from the UK and this is what this talk will be about. So I would like to talk about the genealogy of the uh, deportation flight from the 30th of April 2020 and we'll be focusing on the EU deportations and their legal, political and discursive basis. And I, I would like to argue during, during this talk that the deportability that is the likelihood of being deported of EU citizens was differentiated, that there were differences in spite of the status of EU citizens. And this is what I will explain in my in my today's talk. So I'm situating this presentation within the framework of the study of hostile environment in Britain. And hostile environment was proclaimed in 2012 by then Home Secretary Theresa May, uh, who said the aim is to create here in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. And the, the books whose cover you can see on the, on the screen are, are the, the very important, um, are very, very, very important literature about hostile environment uh, towards third country nationals that are non-EU citizens. Because in principle, it was about so-called illegal or perhaps illegalized migrants. And I would like to show you, uh, nonetheless, that hostile environment was also deployed against EU citizens before Brexit, uh, before Brexit happened. Another body of literature that I'm referring to is the literature about the good and the bad EU citizens. And, um, the, and this, this line between the good and the bad cuts across, um, uh, cuts across nations, but there is, what is visible is the divide between the old and the new uh, EU member countries. For instance, Rzep Nikoska writes about EU racism. I, I, I prefer to say about EU cultural racism following Fox and co-authors. And, say, and, and, and a, this is the approach towards, towards uh, le, uh, people coming from, from poorer member states. Um, uh, so lately uh, in, their, in their paper in International Migration, Barbulesco and Pavel 
explain how European freedom of movement, not only in Britain, they also analyze the case of, of Germany, has been limited for people who are not meeting, meeting the economic eligibility criteria. So this is the second body of literature that I will be uh, basing my talk on. Now I would like to move to my own theoretical framework, and it's all about deportations. So uh, I define deportation as involuntary state assistance departure from the territory of that state. So if there are any legal scholars um, among the participants, uh, any, any lawyers, I adopt a broader definition that home office adopts is talking about deportations because for the for for the home office deportation is only the procedure of sending out of britain people who are uh, who have been convicted of crimes so here we are talking about involuntary state assistance departure from the territory of the state and what's the role of deportations this is something that i would like to ponder about during this talk uh, the seminal works about deportation by William Walters and Nicolas Di Genova argue that deportation is a mean to reinstate state, state sovereignty. And when I was starting my broad research, I, I was thinking about Brexit and deportations as a like uh, 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 Brexit as an event and deportations as a management as a tool of management of, of population of non-citizens as reinstating state sovereignty, as, as taking back control, as, as it was said in Britain uh, before the referendum. However, other authors uh, explain deportations using different optics. So, for instance, Tania Golash Bosa, for, for Tania Golash Bosa, deportation is a way of global management of labor force uh, in, in, the, uh, in capitalism. So, here, what I would like to do is not to speak about global deportation regimes, but rather about context specific deportation regimes, specific to the country that is deporting, but also specific to the nations that are being deported. And more, even more, I will, what I will do is to deconstruct deportation regimes for different population of EU citizens. Not national population, but different groups, different economic groups, people with different characteristics. And we will focus on three different, uh, different uh, groups of deportable EU citizens in the, in the UK. So uh, how we will do it? We will focus on three different aspects of uh, context-specific deportation regimes. The first aspect is law on the books. So we will be looking at regulations that permit the deportation of an individual. The second component of this uh, deportation regime is law in action. How the policies are uh, and are, uh, how the law is putting, uh, how is, is, it, is, it is put, being put into life uh, by in policies. And finally, the third element is what I call ideologies of deportability. And by ideologies of deportability, I mean the discourses that legitimize deportation of certain groups within a certain national context. And let me explain to you how I researched it. So, the, as you already know, the research was done within the uh, research project uh, whose acronym was BRAD, which stands for Brexit and Deportations. And during this two-year research project, I did legal analysis where I, uh, where I, was, when I, where I analyzed the um, uh, the regulations uh, that permitted deportation of EU citizens. The second element of my research was uh, ethnographic fieldwork, and ethnographic fieldwork was aimed at studying law in action. It was multi-sided transnational research in Britain and in Poland, the most import important in numbers uh, country that, that sent them the biggest numbers of EU citizens to, to Britain. So uh, the, this ethnographic fieldwork in, 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 uh, in the UK, I worked in England, mostly in West Midlands, where the University of uh, Wolverhampton is, but also in uh, Northern England and in London. And in Poland, I 
I worked in six different locations following deportees and also voluntary migrants. And finally, the, uh, the, the third component of the research was media discourse analysis, where within the framework of critical discourse analysis, I analyzed uh, British media outlets, uh, daily newspapers, uh, and I will present the outcomes of my uh, media discourse analysis for the period from when the uh, British, uh, when the Brexit referendum was proclaimed in February 2016, uh, uh, up until uh, the end of January 2020, when, when Brexit actually happened. So this is uh, this is the uh, methodological uh, framework. And now I would like to move to the results. Uh, first, I would like to talk about the qualified EU citizens. In order to explain the, 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 the deportations of EU citizens, let's first start with the people who, according to the EU Citizens Directive, are uh, so-called qualified EU citizens, that, that is, people who qualify for the European freedom of movement. So, um, according to treaties, people who uh, to, to qualify for the freedom of movement are individuals who come from some other member state and either work, seek for a job, who study, who have sufficient resources, or who are family members of any of the above four categories. So this is what makes an individual uh, qualifying for the freedom of movement. And in principle, these individuals are not targeted with deportations. Uh, this uh, uh, category of people and their non-deportability is also underpinned by a, an ideology that, that is reproduced in the British media. And let me give you an example. Uh, so here, an example, shortly after the Brexit referendum, Daily Mail wrote, let me quote, Ever since the Brexit vote, there has been an argument about the future status of EU citizens currently living here. Clearly, it would be absurd and unfair to expel anyone who came here legally, is working, paying taxes and making a contribution to society. So here we have description of an individual coming from another EU member state who deserves to stay also after Brexit. And this follows the golden thread of being in legal work and also contributing uh, fiscally and, and socially. So in principle, also in, uh, when it comes to law in action, these individuals were not deported from Britain, but, and in the following sections, I will also uh, speak about the qualified EU citizens who are deported uh, from Britain. So in the, in the next session, section, I would like to speak about three EU populations who are uh, deported from pre-Brexit Britain. So let's start with the convicts. So, uh, so anybody who is uh, who is convicted in Britain and is a qualified person, that means works or studies or is a family member of somebody who, who studies, could be deported. It's and it's also uh, and and this is this is not specific to Britain. This is something that is explained in the EU Citizens Directive 2004. Can be deported following a forward-looking assessment. And according to this assessment, this, this person needs to be uh, considered a threat to public policy, public secu security or public health. So what Britain did was to transpose these EU regulations in a very harsh way, uh, for instance, by removing the sentencing threshold. Um, in 2015, in the UK law, the sentencing threshold disappears. So basically anybody who has contact with criminal law can be targeted with deportation should there be considered a, a, a threat. Uh, another element of the law in practice uh, specific to, to Britain is that there is no legal aid for people with deportation with immigration cases, which also makes it more, more difficult not to be deported. 
so I would like to talk about the uh, ideology of deportability that has been the base for deportation of, uh, of uh, people formally convicted. And here, what is important, we are not only talking about the people who, uh, who were convicts in Britain, but also we're talking about the people who were sentenced in some other European country, in their country of origin or anywhere else. In case Home Office knows about these cases, they can consider if, if, if such a person is uh, poses a threat to the uh, society here. So the British media in the time uh, before the referendum and also following the 2016 referendum uh, was producing and reproducing the discourse about EU citizens uh, who are criminals. And here, importantly, uh, a body of, of uh, media texts were focusing on Eastern Europeans. And I call this discourse the vile Eastern European. And here I would like to give you a couple of examples to give you a taste of this ideology of deportability. Um, so uh, just to start with, a quotation from the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Daily Telegraph uh, quoted uh, retiring old Bailey judge Tim Pontius, who uh, told the newspaper that the criminal justice system is becoming, becoming clogged up with trials of Eastern European criminals. Uh, and quoting him, they wrote, it is commonplace in the court list to see more Polish names, Russian names, Albanian names, Russian names. End quote. So in the time to Brexit referendum between February and and uh, June 2016 that I analyzed, there was a lot of violent cases of, of, of criminals coming from, uh, from Eastern Europe that were being reminded to the public. Those were cases that were happening years before. To create this sense of phenomenological threat to the British public that, that was being created by the mere presence of, uh, of Eastern Europeans and the freedom of movement and lack of controls over border. And that's important because uh, the media were claiming that it was impossible to deport, uh, to deport the, the criminals because their deportation would be, quote, from Daily Mail, in breach of the EEA regulations. So um, another quote would be that, uh, 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 do you believe we can control our borders within the EU? No, we don't even have the right to deport criminals who are EU nationals. So here we have this very uh, straightforward thing between deportation and sovereignty. If we are unable to deport people who are dangerous, then it means that we are not a sovereign country. We have no control over our borders. Easy solution will be to do Brexit. So I think that this um, uh, that this uh, discursive strategy of the vile European Eastern European was one of the most important used by the British um, uh, media uh, in in the days to to Brexit. And now I would like to give you a couple of, of figures to show you that it's not true that the EU citizens were not being deported from from Britain. And let's have a, let's have a look at this at this at this table. Uh, here I would like to draw your attention to uh, the fact that that lately the the the, uh, the proportion of EU citizens uh, among all the deportees has been growing. And in the year to March 2020, almost 50% of all the deportees were coming from EU countries. Um, and we will we will come back to this to this table in a bit when I will, would like to draw your attention to some different uh, elements. But let's talk about the uh, law in action when it comes to convicts. So. Uh, uh, so here, what I would like to draw your attention to the um, differentiated deportability among the EU citizens. The knowledge of ling ing English language is very important, uh, which means that uh, 
people who are in in prisons in in Britain sometimes, as I was told by by immigration lawyers, were purpose, uh, purposefully mistaken uh, by the uh, by the prison guards when they when the prison guards were uh, were giving them the documents for the early removal scheme, explaining the explaining the consequences of early removal scheme. Uh, and explaining that if they accept to be removed earlier uh, and deported, uh, they would not be banned from returning to the UK, which is not true. And also, the legal representative is has been uh, is very important, and those who are not able to pay for the legal represent, uh, representative in the situation that uh, of no legal aid available uh, are also becoming more deportable because people are not really uh, uh, understanding, they don't, they don't really understand what is uh, happening to them and the whole procedure. Uh, this is translated into numbers. So when we look at uh, the numbers of, of deported Romanians, Polish people and Lithuanians, just these three uh, Eastern European nations make, uh, this, make 70 percent of all the deported uh, EU citizens. And well, they are only 40% of EU citizens in the UK. So there is over representation of uh, Eastern Europeans among uh, all uh, deported uh, EU citizens. Another, um, another population for whom I would like to uh, reconstruct the deportation regime are the rough sleepers. Um, EU treaties do not specify rough sleepers as deportable. They can be deported as all of, of all of us only if they are non-qualified. Non so, for instance, if somebody uh, is a rough sleeper, which means in Britain that he or she sleeps on the streets, but works, they shouldn't be deported because they are a qualified person. Uh, but not in Britain between 2016 and 2017. Because uh, in these years, um, rough sleeping was proclaimed abuse and later misuse of the freedom of movement. After this policy was challenged um, and it was uh, it was found unlawful by the High Court. Which in turn uh, was very criticized by the uh, especially pro Brexit media outlets in Britain. So let me let me talk about the uh, uh, about the ideology of deportability uh, concerning uh, rough sleepers. Uh, so uh, it's important that the rough sleepers, especially by pro Brexit media outlets, have been um, identified also as criminals and also portrayed as a threat uh, to uh, public security. Uh, so, for instance, uh, let me quote uh, this uh, excerpt from Daily Mail uh, in the, uh, b before the Brexit referendum. Uh, quote, I'm sure there are brain surgeons and IT specialists from Bucharest beavering away productively in Britain, but many of their fellow citizens have merely transferred their charming Transylvanian culture of criminality. To the streets of our uh, to the streets of our cities, sleeping rough and specializing in aggressive bagging, pickpocketing, and cash point robbery. So here we have uh, the representative pattern of a homeless person who sleeps on the streets, uh, who comes from, uh, in this case, Romania, and we can also assume that there is this implicit racism uh, mm, uh, mm, of, of 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 portraying this person as a Roma Roma individual. Uh, and as I said, the, quo the quotation on the bottom of this slide, uh, I will not read it aloud, but here an example of, critic of the criticism towards the uh, 2017 High Court uh, ruling that found the policy unlawful. And especially the criticism that now individuals who are unlawfully detained and deported uh, had the, the, the right to appeal and get the compensation. So uh, let me talk about uh, uh, the uh, law in action, the practice of, of deporting um, e deporting craft sleepers. Uh, 
because here again, I would like to draw your attention to differentiated deportability of EU citizens. So it started much earlier than in 2016, probably around 2010, 2011, with a secret action, a secret operations by uh, the Home Office, uh, where in London boroughs, in the London borough of Westminster, um, uh, European Union ho uh, rough sleepers were being deported in 2015 we know of 127 individuals who were deported. And in 2016, Operation Ados becomes, uh, also, becomes also operative in other London boroughs, not only in Westminster. And it's so successful, um, and I'm being cynical here, that in May 2016, it becomes nationwide policy of, uh, of finding rough sleeping as an abuse of the freedom of movement. 2017, it is uh, redefined as a misuse of the freedom of movement. So before this, po po this policy uh, ended, after it was found unlawful, about 1,000 people um, were, were deported. I say about because the, uh, because the numbers are not, uh, not public, Home Office uh, does not differentiate between the reasons of uh, deport for deportation in the publicly available statistics. This uh, this data comes from uh, from from British media. But let's come about come back to the uh, to the table. And as you can see, the numbers really start to grow when the policy becomes nationwide. So uh, in 2016, 2017 and 2018, we should also look at this because this is year uh, ending in March 2018. Those are the biggest numbers of, of the EU deportations. And who are deported? Not every uh, EU citizen, obviously. Um, so here the British press was explicit. And Daily Mail wrote, quote, the number of rough sleepers in the capital has fallen for the first time in a decade following a policy to deport homeless Romanians and Poles. Obviously, not only Romanians and Poles, among the people there were also uh, Lithuanian citizens, uh, Latvian citizens, but again, people coming from uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe. So here I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in this uh, precedent of creating a policy of qualifying uh, rough sleeping as, um, as an abuse of the freedom of movement, UK illegalized uh, Eastern European rough sleepers who had the status of EU citizens. And once again, I would like to underline that these people sometimes were in paid work or had the family members who were, were job seekers or even studied. So uh, it was definitely, they were definitely qualified people according to the EU treaties. And finally, the third, uh, the third population that I would like to talk about are non-qualified people, as I call them. And by this, I mean people who neither work, seek for a job, study, have sufficient resources, or have a family member of the above. Um, so, these uh, these individuals, as they do not qualify for the European freedom of movement, uh, could be uh, deported under the EU immigration laws, for instance, under the administrative removal. And uh, these, uh, these deportations are also underpinned by a strong and uh, often reproduced um, ideology of deportability that I have named, quoting, uh, the uh, Daily Mail and the, the Daily Telegraph kick out jobless EU migrants. And when it comes to examples from uh, from the from the press, uh, Daily Mail uh, before the referendum was attacking uh, David Cameron, who who claimed that uh, Britain was effectively deporting people who were uh, unemployed uh, in the UK for over six months which wasn't true. And also after the referendum, uh, this is the quotation on the, on the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, slide, Daily Telegraph was, uh, was arguing that after Brexit, 
uh, UK should be uh, deporting anybody who is uh, coming from uh, from uh, United European Union and who is uh, jobless for more, more than three years, uh, three months, excuse me. So here we have uh, an ideology of deportability that. Uh, identifies somebody who is not in paid work and is not contributing fiscally or socially as uh, as deportable and in practice there is lack of statistics so it's impossible it's, it's impossible to estimate how many people are effectively being administratively removed because of not qualifying for the freedom of movement however um, the home office case workers have been instructed in the guidelines to, um, to be guided by the principle of proportional actions, that is not to target people with deportations. Um, uh, however, uh, what, uh, what was happening, and that was a, uh, it is really under, under researched uh, topic, is that every day bordering by the street level bureaucrats, such as uh, workers of the state benefit agencies, and Greenfield and uh, Dagilitia give example of the people who uh, who uh, are, are claiming state benefits, but the uh, the worker council workers uh, explain them that they shouldn't be here. They should be uh, should be claiming benefits in their country of origin, and instruct them to go back or even sponsor a, a sponsor a ticket. So. Um, uh, so this is a, another another example of of everyday uh, bordering that I think uh, we, we must be very wary of, uh, especially in the times following the end of the transition period. And now I would like to move to conclusions, I, and I have uh, divided them to two parts. The first part. Uh, I would like to uh, ponder about the role of EU deportations in Britain. And in the second part, I would like to talk about what lesson uh, can we take from all of this for uh, for the time after the end of the transition period? What should we expect uh, from uh, really next month? So th in the first part, as I said, the role of European deportations. As, as, I, as I wanted to explain during the course of this talk, uh, Britain has already taken the, uh, the control over its borders and it was effectively deporting EU citizens. Um, however, uh, these deportations were differentiated and uh, not all the EU citizens in Britain were equally deportable. Uh, so the basis for uh, for body of these deportations was the economic chauvinism, as especially I wanted to show with the third case of, of non-qualifying people subject to everyday bordering. But also uh, this could be illustrated with the deportation of the homeless, Eastern and uh, Central and Eastern Europeans. For uh, home office that we know which was working under the pressure of quotas of the numbers of people who should have been deported. We know this because uh, Amber Root, who was the secretary, home secretary, revealed this. Deportation of a highly vulnerable homeless person was a very easy bureaucratic choice. But also a tool of biopolitic. These people were being deported from the streets of Westminster, where a lot of capital is being located, where the where the tourists are are are, uh, are coming. So obviously, it was a biopolitical uh, move to to deport and and to uh, govern this population, and also underpinned by the cultural cultural racism. And the second part of this uh, of these conclusions, what lesson shall we take from this and uh, what what can we expect uh, from the end of the transition period? Now we will not be talking about EU citizens with this privileged status of EU citizen in Britain, but are rather EU immigrants as the EU immigrants will be equalized in their law, uh, in their uh, rights with uh, non-EU uh, citizens in, in Britain. 
Um, in the time uh, uh, before the end of the transition period, uh, Home Office has deployed the European Union Settlement Scheme for uh, EU citizens who uh, reside in Britain uh, and, and who will move here before the end of the transition period. And what uh, what is interesting, I think, should be, and what we should be looking at is the situation when the people who uh, have been granted just the pre-settled status will be trying to upgrade to indefinitely to remain that is called here um, settled status. So we should be looking at the basis. Uh, perhaps they might change. Uh, whereas people who will come after the end of the transition period will have to come here uh, under new ways of coming to the UK, uh, most importantly through the points based system. And we know that it will be difficult to meet the requirements, especially because of high economic, uh, high financial threshold. So I want to pay so much attention to what I call the ideologies of deportability because I believe that they will be very important and they are the basis for what will be happening in the future. So we already know that EU migrants now being uh, uh, equalized uh, with, with non-EU migrants will be uh, subject to automatic deportation uh, in case of, uh, uh, of being convicted for a year uh, in prison. Uh, so this is this is about the first population that I talked about convicts. The second uh, the, 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 se the second element uh, are the uh, of this uh, are these economic inequalities. And so we already know uh, that in in October uh, 2020 um, the new uh, immigration regulations uh, have been explained. And their uh, uh, rough sleeping has been defined as a basis for cancellation of visas or refusal for applicants. So it is possible that what was happening in between 2016 and 2017 will now repeat uh, for the um, for the people who uh, who who will uh, for for the future uh, rough sleepers. Um, and it's important that it will be happening under a very different scenario from what we know now, uh, because obviously uh, now we are at the onset of, of economic crisis caused by caused by COVID. By COVID. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, I invite you to look at what is happening um, also to EU citizens. And before I end this presentation, I would like to, to thank the people who, who made my BRAD research possible. Uh, most importantly, the supervisor of the project, Aleksandra Galacinska from the, uni from the University of Wolverhampton. Also, Francesco Paradiso, uh, uh, who was uh, a member of the team really from the beginning when we, when we submitted the proposal to the European Commission. And I would also like to thank Eva Tichotska and Katarzyna Gut, who helped me with the fieldwork. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I will be happy to take your questions and comments. Well, in fact, the first question is here is how, how are you going to take your research forward? What's what's the next steps with this? Um, Mina has asked that question, very relevant question. I was going to ask, where do we go from here? Um, as we end this year, rather depressing, um, to put it mildly, but where do, where does the research go? I think we might know where we as a country seem to be sadly heading, but where does where does the research into this area itself go? Because we really don't want other countries to follow. We really, you know, I think many of us are really ashamed, as I've already said, to be British at the moment. I know several people on the call feel the same. Um, but where does the research work go? What, yeah. What's the next steps with this sort of research? So uh, I would like to speak about uh, the following steps, both in terms of like temporality. So first of all, I would like to continue with this research in order to see what change, what what, what will be the changes after the end of the transition period, uh, because there will be over 3 million people who will be now subject to immigration uh, rules in Britain uh, without this uh, protection of, of European citizenship, EU citizenship. So this is this is the, the first, uh, I think, very important step to do is to study the changes and 
also as I as I try to, to to say at the end of the presentation, those those will be the changes in a very different economic circumstances. Yeah. And economic chauvinism is one of uh, one of the things that ha happens all over the world, uh, and uh, deportation is is one of the means of of uh, of doing this. So, for instance, my previous research was about uh, United States and deportation from the United States. So, the biggest numbers in were of of deportations from the United States was 2013, which was like a direct result of economic crisis of 2008-2009. And another way of th that I would like to extend this research. Uh, is to involve also other forms of bordering, not only uh, deportation coordinated by the Home Office, but also other forms of what I have called here, quoting uh, Yuval Davis, uh, everyday bordering, what the councils are doing, what the charities are doing, because in the course of this uh, of this research, I have known from highly vulnerable individuals that were they were on several occasions by several different agencies offered to, to return to Poland, in this case, but I would also like to study cases of, of other uh, EU nations, uh, importantly Romanians, uh, Lithuanians, because these are the, 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 the nationalities that have been more targeted. Uh, so, uh, so also I would like to study this, uh, let's say, bordering by the councils, but also bordering by uh, by, by, by homeless charities uh, in these programs of international reconnections. Thank you for that really, really comprehensive answer. And the next question actually is very much related to that. It's coming from Medka, who says, first of all, thank you for a really excellent talk. And I think she's saying that for all of us. Um, but her question is, have other U European countries also demonstrated ca characteristics of hostile environments, similar you know, as we have for immigrants? And are there any signs of any backlash from EU member states as a response to the UK EU deportations, has it has anybody said anything about this? Is it has it been reported elsewhere? That's a very very good question, really good question. So uh, uh, especially with this with this element of the backlash and the possible resistance from the countries that are actually receiving deportees. So, but but to start with the hostile environments in other EU countries. Uh, uh, under the President Sarkozy, obviously we all remember the uh, Roma people, citizens of uh, of the European Union coming from most important, most importantly Romania, who are being put on the buses and and deported. So definitely, UK is not the only example. I also refer to uh, uh, to Barbulescu and Favel's uh, uh, text uh, article about. Uh, about uh, comparison between UK and Germany and the limiting uh, the freedom of movement on the basis of economic eligibility. So there are moves of circumscribing and limiting the freedom of movement, especially to the more vulnerable and excluded individuals. And I think as the as it is most mostly the more more vulnerable and excluded individuals who are being deported. That's why the countries do not respond for them, do not uh, do not support them, and there is so little backlash. So, for instance, in the course of my research, what I what I was trying to do was to put in contact with the Polish embassy and say how on earth they orchestrated the deportation of 33, 35 individuals, Polish nationals, under under uh, the, the pandemic and under the, the uh, borders that were being uh, closed. Uh, so yeah, so that's I think that's that's the problem that this, the, the vulnerability of these individuals is not only happening in Britain, it's a transnational vulnerability and also lack of protection from uh, from their uh, countries of origin. And for instance, one of the individuals who are on board of that deportation pl plane from 30th of April this year, there was a lady who spent six months in jail here in Britain. She was leaving behind a 11 year old kid. So when she when she flew back to Poland, she boarded a bus she went to her town of origin in uh, uh, so, uh, southeastern Poland and she had to isolate in a hotel because she didn't have a home there. 
And it was the local community to, that have to bear, bear the burden of this deportation and the local community have to pay for her hotel, for, for, for her food, to make sure that she could do the isolation. Uh, what, what can one say? Let me move on to the next question. A question from Ola. Um, do we have any evidence or data of why Eastern Europeans were mostly targeted? Mm -hmm. So uh, when, it, when it comes to Eastern Europeans, uh, and this is something that I deliberately didn't talk about today because it would make, it would make my talk even longer, uh, we are talking about the people who, in case of A8 countries, the countries that uh, uh, accessed the European Union in 2004, uh, among them Poland, were deportable, uh, uh, just like other uh, uh, other non-Europeans. Because, so for instance, uh, we we had people who who lived in uh, uh, in London, a uh, big Polish community, and they were experiencing rates. So it's like a pub dependence. I would explain just like this. Uh, people who are deported, who are being deported before the accession of their countries and continue to be to be deported after the accession of their countries. So uh, so even even today, 16 years after Poland became a EU member, people still remember and is par part of the shared uh, shared memory, collective memory, as they themselves were not being let in Britain in Calais. Uh, when they were traveling to Britain on buses, on when on, on, or when they saw an immigration raid by home on a Sunday morning in the just next door, when everybody, let's say, eight people who were living there, uh, were deported. So, uh, so I think this this path dependence is is one of uh, important elements. And then oh, as well. Um, the EU uh, the uh, sorry, migration from uh, Central and Eastern Europe is, is relatively new. Uh, that's why uh, there is a lot of people who don't, don't, don't uh, speak English well enough and their uh, economic uh, situation is not, uh, is not good. So they cannot pay for legal representative that would help them not to be deported. Thank you for that. Um, Further question coming in from Tom Dickens, a very interesting question. Um, why the emphasis on Polish, Lithuanian and Romanian deportation? Does this reflect the larger number of migrants coming from these countries? And then he goes on, I would have expected to hear at least some reference to Slovak, Czech and Hungarian Roma, given the disproportionate lack of formal qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, so. Mm -hmm. So Tom's, Tom's question uh, refers to my future uh, research interest to, to, to study the case of Polish, Romanians and Lithuanians. Uh, so here my choice is uh, because these tr two, three national groups are the most represent represented among the EU, EU deportees. Yeah. And it's like for, for Lithuanians, I, I'm really looking forward to, 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 to researching this case because the numbers of Lithuanian migrants are not significant. However, the numbers of, of, deep, of Lithuanian deportees are almost as big as, as the Polish people. And uh, like there is 10, 10, more, uh, uh, 10 more times more, more Polish people than Lithuanians in the UK. So. Uh, so it's it's just about the numbers, but uh, Tom's uh, Tom's comment is very important as he draws our attention to uh, to the um, ethnic factor in in the uh, differentiated deportability, what they call differentiated uh, deportability, and obviously the the Roma people have been uh, over targeted, not only in the UK but as I also mentioned in France. And other other EU countries, so um, I'm I'm not planning to study Roma people from Slovakia or or Czech Republic or from Hungary, but I'm really looking forward to explore their case when I when I look at the Romanian uh, Romanian case. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and then a final question we've got from Fiona Colatori, uh, really interesting, very practical question. Um, she says, thank you for presenting this emotive, thorough and much needed research. Do you have any thoughts on what we can do as an institution to resist hostile thinking within our curriculums and campuses? 
Very, very nice, thoughtful question. What, yeah. what can we do practically? It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, and it also a difficult one, especially that uh, starting from next year, also EU citizens will, ha will, will, will not be paying the, uh, the domestic fees, so it will be e more difficult for uh, EU uh, pros prospective EU students uh, to come. And what what I was observing during my uh, during my uh, fellowship here at the University of Wolverhampton is that sadly even the the lecturers are made uh, complicit and take part uh, in everyday bordering, as uh, as you are expected to 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 check the immigration status, uh, make sure that all the paperwork uh, is uh, is in order of of students, uh, which really shows how this hostile environment is permeating is 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 uh, the 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 also the higher education system, uh, which I think is very very sad. Uh, but not only when it comes to students, it's also it's also when it comes to HR, when we are asked about bringing our passports, showing the visa, renewing it. Um, uh, so it's a very difficult question, Fiona. And I think we have to think about how we can how we can do it, but I'm afraid resist. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments on it. I'm going to give you one more. We've got another question coming in from Martin Dangerfield. Saw Martin this afternoon. Um, Martin's question is, well, first of all, thank you for an excellent, if somewhat depressing talk. Um, I think Ma I think Martin is speaking for many of us saying that um, it really is excellent. Thank you for it. But it's also a bit depressing and a bit sad. I think many of us feel like that. Um, but the question is, you included some content from Eurosceptic UK Press, the Mail and the Telegraph. I'm just wondering whether you came across any, intervation, any interventions from the pro-EU newspapers to criticise the UK authorities and highlight the bias against citizens from new member states. Yeah, so uh, during this presentation, I focused on the part of my uh, of my analysis uh, of the pro pro Brexit titles, the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph. But I also analyzed um, Daily Mirror as an example of tabloid and the Guardian. So there and I must underline this, the uh, the discourse was different. Uh, because also uh, the agenda uh, uh, in the times to Brexit was was different. Uh, so um, yeah, it, the, the, here the here the discourse was a, a different one. Also also criticizing. So together with uh, in this part of analysis, together with Alexandra Galasinska, we identified the different ways of of uh, framing the EU citizens in Britain. For instance, importantly, there were. Um, uh, comparisons to the Windrush scandal, and for those of you who are not familiar, those were the uh, this was the targeting with immigration uh, enforcement of the people who came here uh, from uh, um, really mainly from Jamaica. Uh, so uh, so here, uh, especially the Guardian was making the point that if, uh, if we don't uh, take care of the situation, the winter scandal can uh, can repeat itself even uh, in a bigger bigger form because we're talking about three million people. So uh, uh, after having analyzed also this pro-European media outlets, what what we found as very very um, I think worrying was that there was no um, discursive strategy that would frame us all, the UK, UK people and European people, just as like normal human or people uh, who are who share the European identity, which I think was already like very worrying that the European identity is not very uh, uh, very important here. And another worrying element of uh, worrying finding of this analysis is that uh, EU citizens by the more, more, more pro remain titles were framed as victims. Uh, and this victimizing okay. strategy is not not uh, really a way out of it neither. So um, so that was this another finding. 
Can I keep you for one more question? Uh, the questions are coming in slowly, slowly. It's not the way we want to be taking them, but they are coming in. Um, question from Marcos Lanaselli. Um, do you think the UK could have triggered other countries to also leave the EU? Do you think that's likely to happen? I think we're going to see at the end of December whether UK will leave uh, with a deal or with no, without a deal. And I think it's it's being decided in Brussels now. Um, but uh, so obviously it, it will very much depend on the economic outcomes. Uh, however, um, I when it comes to, to my field of study, the EU migration has not been framed as such a big problem in other EU countries. So uh, that would not be an, an argument. Um, uh, obviously, there is a, a lot of Euroscepticism also in the in the country that I come from, Poland, uh, Hungary. There are countries that are um, are talking about its all EU exits. Uh, however, I, I, I think and I hope that it will not happen. Thank you for that. Um, this must be the final question. Um, question that's just come in um, from Flavio. Um, good evening. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you believe that all of the UK deportations were unfair, or whether a certain certain proportion of them, certain sorry, a certain proportion of them, and why. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what I uh, whether uh, all the UK deportations. So we are talking about not only EU deportations. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he, here it would be like my very very personal uh, personal view if I if I find them unfair or not fair. So I think I will I will withdraw from 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 giving my opinion on this. However, I would like to um, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, when it comes to deportation of people who uh, are convicts in in the UK, we, we we should always take into account what really caused the the crime. Uh, and uh, and whether we believe that deportation is the solution, because uh, during my re research of, of deportations in the UK and in the US, I have noted that deportation is a very local solution to the fact. So just let me give you an example. Uh, mm -hmm, please. And it, it, it will be a little bit personal. So uh, um, when I was doing the research in Mexico among the people who are deported from the United States, um, there was a person who was deported after uh, after murdering uh, uh, somebody in the United States. So the United States uh, uh, imprisoned him and then he was threw out to Mexico. And in Mexico he reoffended and he, he murdered his girlfriend who was a very close friend of mine. So the question is whether it was a solution. I think what is important when it comes, like mainly when it comes to uh, to former convicts, is the rehabilitation, uh, because uh, we may be interested in the uh, um, uh, public security in the UK. However, the question is what will happen after the deportation of this individual in the country that will receive him. On that note, and a very personal note, thank you for sharing it. Can I just say a huge thanks for all of us for a, a really, really interesting, uh, thoroughly researched piece of work that you've presented in a really very clear manner to us.